Hey, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk, how to deploy machine learning models into production. Uh, thanks for stopping by. I'm actually really excited to talk about this topic because I think it's very important uh, that we talk about the, uh, the second step of the machine learning flow that everyone knows, uh, which is deploying machine learning models to production because I believe that's, that's, the real, that's where the real value of data science comes in, right? So in the whole cycle, till this point you have been investing and now you come to the point that you deploy this model somewhere that, that brings value to the enterprise. And uh, strange enough, not a lot of enterprises talk about it for several reasons. Maybe it's too complex the way they do it, uh, it's a trade secret, or maybe it's just outright too embarrassing because they do it in such a bad way. So my, uh, my motivation with this talk is, uh, is to give you some insights and also some food for thought and, and some, let's say, tracks to follow upon if, if you are on that path as well. Uh, before I go into details, I briefly introduce myself. My name is Sumit Gul. I am a software engineer in IBM Research and Development Labs in South Germany. Uh, if you're on Twitter and on that kind of stuff, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty responsive, so if you have any questions, just uh, write me. In my day-to-day -day life, I do the development work for the uh, product called Watson Studio, uh, but I'm also involved uh, in some client engagements for IBM. Uh, exactly, so I'll, the, that's the agenda for the talk. I'm gonna talk about motivation, so like why am I talking about this and why I think it's important, uh, what a Python model uh, actually is. Like uh, we know model, 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 but what, 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 it, what thing is it exa uh, exactly? Uh, what kind of different production environments look like? And then I'll uh, try to demo that uh, in the standard production environments, which is Cloud Foundry, Docker, Kubernetes, or through managed services. Uh, so I think all of us have seen this picture or some variant of this picture many times. So this picture does nothing but basically gives an overview of how a machine learning flow looks like or data science flow looks like. So it starts with data acquisition, business understanding where you pose a problem that you're trying to solve with your machine learning model, you data understanding, data preparation, modeling, and evaluation. And eventually, may or may not, comes a step of deployment. But surprise, surprise, the work does not end there, right? So if you're a data scientist, I would be really, really sad if I come to an office every day for two months to model uh, hyperparameter optimization, have final set of uh, parameters, which does the perfect results, but it just dies there because nobody deployed this. So that would be really sad for me. And I think that's where the ops part of machine learning comes in, which is, I would say, even a relatively newer field than machine learning itself. So I would really like to think that the rest of it is its development and the ops part comes in when, when it comes to deployment. So uh, as I said, I am uh, also pretty often talking to uh, IBM clients and, uh, and the pattern that we, sh uh, that we see that they have been employing is that uh, there's a data scientist who has been working, for example, let's say a Python model. Uh, he did some work for weeks or months or whatever their cycle is. He thinks that he has a good enough model and then he just throws it over the wall to the application development team, IT department, whatever, and then their job is to now develop an, uh, an application with that, uh, which can be used. It's, it's fine if it works for uh, enterprises, but I see some flaws with this uh, technique, which is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of gap or, or hurdles if there's a such huge fence between data science team and uh, development team because, for example, let's say after a week of work, Mike decides that now he has found a new amazing feature for his uh, machine learning model, which improves the performance. Uh, but, but Deb is still relying on, on the old data set the, or old information she had that, okay, I need so many parameters to train this model. So yeah, just, so my point here is that it's, it's better uh, if you move, slowly move towards the second model, which is uh, my data scientist and Deb, the developer, they are working in unison. So Mike uh, develops a model, maybe in Python or whatever. And then he closely works with the data scientist, uh, de developer himself, herself, uh, to, to combine that and, and deploy that into production where you're supposed to bring the value of the machine learning model. Uh, so uh, just, just to clear the, uh, the stage for the uh, presentation, I'm concentrating on production environments in the cloud because that's what all the cool kids do. Uh, Python is the primary pr uh, programming language here. Uh, Microservices-based architecture, so no monolithic structures. Uh, traditional machine learning algorithms, no deep learning. That's just for the fact because it's easier to deploy traditional machine learning algorithms because they are smaller in size, usually. And data science team and software development team are working in unison. Uh, before I go into the details, I'll just give you a quick, quick, 
uh, hinge of the uh, use case that I'll be using. So it's, it's actually real life data case uh, data set from a credit card fraud detection company. Uh, what they did was they took near to 300,000 credit card transactions. Uh, they had, I don't know how many hundred parameters. They did pr principal component analysis and reduced that to 31 columns. Uh, these are like various aspects of a, of a tra credit card transaction that a bank uh, notices in their system. So they anonymize the data so we don't know what these columns mean, but like two or, two or three of them are tangible, which is time of the transaction, uh, how much amount was there in this transaction, and the class. So if it's a zero, it's a non-fraud transaction. Uh, if it's a one, it's a fraud transaction. Okay, so that's what the data set a data scientist got. Uh, he chose Python to be his uh, language of choice. So he started working, for example, in this case, he's using a random forest classifier. So he did the, the standard workflow of ingesting the data, cleaning the data, and eventually modeling it using a random forest classifier. So this side is the, is the uh, development path for the data science. That's where my production environment comes in and where is, is, let's say, my end goal where I want to deploy this model. Now, how do I reach there? There are several ways. The first one is unfortunately the most common that we have seen till now, which is like uh, some data scientists did a model. And then since you think about production environment, you think about Java applications, Node applications, C, C++ applications. So how do they communicate with each other? One very bad of the way of doing that is that you translate those models into Python, uh, into C, C++, and then redeploy them. Uh, which is okay for maybe for performance factors, but it's really bad for, for time to market or time, time to target, right? So you have, if you have to rewrite everything, it's at least one or two weeks gap before. And it's possible in the fast moving world that your model lost the value it had. Uh, there's PMML, so you can translate the kind of the type of the model, but they are not meant to be very stable. Uh, the, third ball, uh, the third way, which I really like a lot, is, is a, you just take your Python model, you serialize this, and you deploy it as a Python application serving a REST API. Uh, why REST API? Because so if your application can talk HTTP, it can talk web, it can talk to this application. So this was the side of, of Python machine learning model. How does a production environment might look like? So, uh, I know every production environment is different, but it's one or the other flavor of this one. Uh, why? So we are here with my serialized object of my Python, which is my Python model. I will go into details of that, what, what exactly. So it's, it's basically nothing, it's just, just some bytes. It's a blob. Uh, and, and, you, if you want to, and you want to save that into a database. Why would you save a model into a database? Because uh, you want to keep lineage what model was deployed in my production environment, what time? So for example, let's say 20th June, my model did a uh, prediction. If I want to look at that in like one week, I want to know uh, which model, which version of my model was deployed and why it predicted what. I just do not want to save a blob of data. I want to also like enhance this, augment the information with the version of the model, the name of the model, machine learning framework that I used for it, and what was the performance of my model. So I save that model, and now how would my, let's say, machine learning app would look like, right? So it will say, this is my app, the lower block. It says, uh, my logic is my model. I get it, I connect to a database, I download my model in there. Depending upon if I'm using Python, R, Scala, PySpark, whatever, I download that framework. Let's say, imagine a Docker container in there. Since I'm serving it as a REST, uh, REST, and, uh, REST API endpoint, I need some sort of web server. It could be Flask, it could be Tornado, anything of your choice. You load the machine learning model, create a route for your application, which is like, okay, predict, for example. Uh, you prepare your data coming in, for example. So in the modeling stage, you used all those 300 transactions that you had to build your model. Now in the predict st uh, stage, what happens? There's a new request coming in from, for example, your bank portal, which says uh, there's a new credit card transaction with so, so many features. Can you tell me if it's a fraud or not? So that's your uh, prepare step. You run the prediction, do some post-processing, and return the result to the S uh, REST API endpoint. So let's put some uh, real life context into that. Uh, imagine any e-commerce company of your choice. I'm sure it was not Amazon in your mind. So you put your e-commerce company in the perspective, there are customers. Let's imagine this is served by microservices, so one microservice is serving the UI, one is handling of the, buck, uh, the basket, one is taking care of the orders, whatever. Then comes a new order, right from there. Uh, the uh, 
Platform here now wants to know if this order is a fraud or, or this transaction is a fraud or not. What it will do, it will do a call, REST, and AP, a REST call to its machine learning model and asking it, tell me if it's a fraud or not. Now comes the serious questions of this, this whole business, right? So since now your machine learning model is such a tightly coupled part of your system, you have to put some requirements on, on this uh, machine learning model. So it's not a toy use case anymore. So you have to say, okay, what is your maximum response time? If it's a credit card transaction, you cannot say machine learning model, give me something in five minutes. No, that, that, that doesn't work like that. Milliseconds, depending upon your requirements. Availability, it should be available all the time. So if your platform is 24 seven, your model should be 24 seven as well. A quality confidence of prediction. So if your machine learning model says, I'm 40% sure this is not a fraud. What do I learn from that, right? 40% sure it's not a fraud, I can better flip a coin, 50%, so I know it better. So just, just give me something which is more than rubbish knowledge. Uh, what's your max return time? So modeling is a recursive process, if you, ima if you remember the slide from before. So model which is relevant today might not be tomorrow relevant. So what's the maximum retrain time for your model? Uh, and uh, does that mean a uh, uh, downtime, right? So if I'm retraining a model, does it mean that I cannot use my platform anymore? Things like that. So impose those kind of requirements. Uh, deployment uh, with Cloud Foundry. So how many of you are aware of Cloud Foundry already? Ah, good, a good mass. So for the people uh, who are not aware of Cloud Foundry, so Cloud Foundry is a standard platform as a service. Uh, it's kind of a software stack which you can deploy on your data center. Uh, it was developed by VMware originally, and I think now it's owned by Pivotal Software. Uh, what Cloud Foundry does is, Cloud Foundry makes the life of data scientists very easier, uh, of application developers very easier. It takes care of the application lifecycle management, how many instances do you want. If something goes wrong, it says, okay, one application died, I want to start a new one. And it takes care of logging, monitoring, routing, things like that. So in the context of Cloud Foundry application, how would it look like? So uh, Cloud Foundry has the concept of build pack. So imagine this is like a Docker container, Docker image. In my build pack, I would say connect to my database, load my model, and do the same thing. So since the uh, example I'm using is a, a Python uh, machine learning use case, uh, scikit-learn, so I import scikit uh, package in my uh, application. I import the Flask, uh, so Flask is like a web server, so a standard web server. Uh, you create the route, uh, you prepare scoring data, run prediction, and serve it as a REST end API. Now, the questions which are very specific to the production environment you're using, how do you configure your app? You do not want to store your credentials in the application. Maybe you call a GitHub repo to get the credentials for connecting to Cloudant. Uh, your database of choice, uh, how many instances do you want? So Cloud Foundry also takes care of load balancing. Uh, if your app is like, first day it was like five requests per second, next day it's 1,000 requests per second, so you can set it to scale like number of instances you want. Zero downtime deployments, how do you deploy a new version of your application, map and map routes, things like that, crashes, recovery, workload scaling. So depending upon those questions, you, you decide on those things. Yeah, I was talking about build pack, so just imagine this as uh, like different kind of pre-built Docker images for, for Kubernetes, for example. So since it was a Python application, I will choose the uh, Python build pack. Uh, I will go into detail of that in, uh, in the demo, but just, just keep it in your mind that, uh, for example, I deployed this Cloud Foundry, uh, I developed this Cloud Foundry app, which is in my project called Fraud Detection API. From the CLI, I do CF push, which basically means push my application. I think in Kubernetes world, it will be kube control deploy or something like that. Uh, depending upon where my configuration comes in, I set the environment variables for my credentials, things like, things like that and which loads the database, uh, model to the database. Now my app is up and running, and the application, any application uh, practically in the world, if I do not have a secure, a secure authentication on that, can create a POST request and get the result back. Now, let me go back quickly into the application so you have better idea what I'm talking about. So this is actually a very, very lean uh, application end-to-end. -end. I think it's not more than like 100 lines of code, which you don't see. It's too bad. Okay. Let me 
bigger, make it a bit bigger. No, it's too big. So, can everyone read it? Perfect. Uh, it's actually nothing very much going on. So there's just one Python script. It's called hello.py, very innovative of me. Uh, it says import from Cloudant. Just give me a quick second. Actually, I just realized I should give you more context into what the use case is. Yeah, just to give you uh, more insights into what my uh, fraud detection use case is, uh, these lines are not important. Just to give an idea, this is a real transaction from the credit card. It says at this time there were so many features. This was 149.62 dollars, euros, whatever, and the class was zero. It's a non-fraud case. Uh, then comes the case of preparing the data. You, you uh, divide your set into training set, uh, uh, test set, in this case, we are just doing a very uh, simple random forest mod classifier. You train the model, which took like 1.6 seconds, all in all 1.2 seconds. Uh, you make predictions of that. Uh, this is the standard confusion metrics. If the weights are higher on the, this diagonal, your model is good. But since, uh, if you noticed here, they are just actually out of 284 transactions, I think there's just 500 which are a fraud cases, so it's, it's a very skewed problem. Uh, so one way of identifying if your model is doing good or bad is the precision and recall. Precision just simply means if, uh, if your model says it's a fraud, how sure you can be that it's actually a fraud. And the recall is uh, if your model says uh, it's, or, or recall is how many fraud cases it, it can actually catch. So this was done by a colleague of mine. He's a real time, like real life data scientist. He's never happy with the models he has. So he's always optimizing them, defining the grid with hyperparameter optimization, uh, doing different uh, training validation sets with cross validation, evaluate the best model. He, I think, trained, I don't know, like 100 models before he came to his model called RF Best, Random Forest Best Model. And at this point, he saved this. So it's, uh, I'm saving this to a Cloudant database. It could be any database of a choice. Cloudant is a NoSQL database. Uh, so since it's a blob, it's, it's a very, I think, optimum use case. So Cloudant is basically CouchDB. I put my credentials in there, uh, import the Cloudant database, create a connection to that, create a models database, save the document there, name it Random Forest Model with this ID and this is my attachment. Like, this is my document, which has this blob attachment. Now, let me quickly go through, go to the code that I had there. Yep, so I import the Cloudant library, so I can also uh, download that model in my application. I import pandas and Flask as my web server. I start the web application here, app is equal to Flask. If I have credentials, so if, if it's running, so credentials in Cloud Foundry are called VCAP services. Uh, if it's running in Cloud Foundry, it will take the credentials from that environment. Uh, since I'm doing it locally at the moment, if I have a VCAP local.json, it will read uh, the credentials, uh, the username, password, uh, the database name, create a connection to the database, and download the database. That's it. It just says get attachment of the model. Pickle and pickle. So, are you aware of pickle and pickle? So, in, in, in Python, you create a model, and if you want to serialize that object, you say pickle it. It just converts that Python object into, into a serialized object. And there's actually nothing much happening. I create just one root, which is serving an index HTML. It's a standard HTML file, which has a form, and which in turn makes a call to the API predict endpoint. What this API predict endpoint does is it says, okay, incoming request for scoring. It reads your data from the post uh, request call. It does the model.predict. So since your model is now loaded as model, it does a prediction on this model object and just returns it as, uh, as a response to the, to the request. Okay, now let me go ahead and show that to you. How would that work? Let me also make that a bit bigger. Uh, 
Okay, so here you see here is my file called hello.py. So since now I'm in my local environment, I would just say Python hello.py. It says found local weak app services. So since I'm running in my local environment, now it just started a web server which is uh, being opened at port 8000. Uh, now let me go to the browser window I have. Okay. Yep, so this is basically nothing, just, uh, just a rest like uh, there's a UI guy in my team who's very uh, fond of doing fancy stuff, so he just, in five minutes, built up this form for me. Now I want to score this, so what do I do for that? Let me just get the body. I just want to get the uh, response object. What? Why? Uh, I got it here. Just give me a second. Yep, so this is the my response body. So let's imagine it like a new request came in to find out if it's a fraud or not fraud. Uh, it gave me those 31 features that are required by model. Uh, I just say, okay, submit this. If my application is running, it says zero, which means it's not, uh, it's not a fraud case, and I responded to the API call. If we look at the logs of the application at the moment which is running, okay, incoming request for scoring, if everyone can see it. Uh, these are the uh, f features I got for this request, and then I responded with prediction zero. So I think it's not a non-fraud. I think it's a non-fraud. Now, so this was my local environment, that's how I, Basically also every application developer or software uh, data scientist work, they do everything locally and now, now if they feel confident about it, they want to push it to production. Now let's go to the second stage of that, which is, let me shut down this over. Yeah, uh, that is my Cloud Foundry application. Now, that also looks actually pretty lean. The only thing that I need to deploy this to my application is I want to say that it's a Python application. I want to name it Fraud Detection API. I want to host it at, uh, as a host like Fraud Detection API v1, version one, and I think my application is not so famous yet, so I just give it one gigabytes of memory. Now I go back to my terminal and I say CF push which tries to find out, okay, I already know that you have a manifest file. I'm using the route fraud detection API, bluemix.net, like this is the IBM Cloud uh, domain name. Since I already have an app running with that, it says I will stop that app because I'm updating this one, it will deploy the new app. So it identify, okay, I need a Python build pack for this one. It will download the Python build pack in your Warden container. So in the meantime, this is being deployed. Uh, I'll tell you briefly about Warden containers. So everybody knows about Docker containers because they are uh, very famously used in Kubernetes. Uh, Cloud Foundry works with Warden containers. It's very similar, but there are some differences with Warden containers and Docker containers. Docker containers support the various kinds of file systems. Warden containers support less of them. They work with build packs. They, up till now, I think so recently now, they can do also multiple ports, but Warden containers uh, traditionally have been just uh, possible to open one port per application. Now it's just doing that, now my app is running, uh, now it's doing all the Python stuff which is required. So all the packages that I listed there, it will download those packages, install those packages. I hope it finishes fast. In the meantime, let me just copy, copy this URL so I can use it. Okay, so this does not exist just because the application is still being deployed. So I'm on uh, conference Wi-Fi, so this might take a few seconds. Ah, 
successfully destroyed the container, so I already had the application running, so it says okay, since you're updating it and you didn't do the rep uh, replication strategy, so it will kill the existing container. And now it's, uh, so since I said I just want one instance of this because my application is not so famous yet, uh, it says I'm trying to start those containers. Hopefully it will successfully start that. Yep, it started, so now let's go to the term browser and say, ah, my fraud detection API, it's there. So I just don't want to show you this page, but I just want to tell you that since, since now it's a REST API, which I did not put any authentication yet, basically anyone in the room, if you copy this, can actually use it, uh, use this post body, and you'll get a response. So let me just copy that post body to just make sure it's actually running. Let me get it from here. So my app is up and running there. So as I said, production environment can have different flavors. In your company, it's maybe different, or in your local environment, it's different. But the main themes and features here remain the same. Now, since a lot of people are also using Kubernetes, let me go to quickly tell you how it might look like if I want to do it with Kubernetes. Uh, basically, the only difference is this file. And I'm not kidding, it's just this Docker file. What I do in this Docker file is I am using this uh, base image Python 363. So the community uh, releases those images. I'm just using this image, which already has all the things I need. I copy my application into working directory. I copy all the requirement files. I just do pip install, copy my static files. And I say as an entry point, when my container comes up, execute this script which basically at the end does the same. So if I have Minikube running on it, I had it, but it died on me like 15 minutes ago. Let me just try if it's running. Yeah, it takes too much time, so I, I think it's not worth it. I'll go back to the presentation. Uh, okay. What have we got here? So. I did the Cloud Foundry MO with Kubernetes. It's, uh, as I said, it's basically this side, the, the right side of the slide basically looks exactly the same. Uh, the, the differences come be, be, uh, based upon your production environment that you're using at the moment. So if your enterprise or company or you yourself feel more comfortable with Kubernetes because you have experience with that, just keep on doing that. Uh, it has a few added benefits that you have much more control on your environment if you need it. So on Kubernetes, you are actually talking to the uh, like uh, OS level dependency, so it's, it's easier for you to manage. If it's a deep learning model, it's easier to add uh, GPU nodes on that. Uh, why? Because uh, you can just do a CUDA, CUDA image and then, then you have a Docker running with GPU support. Uh, how do you manage your crashes, recovery, routing, workload scaling, uh, workload scaling, things like that. Uh, the basic difference, it would be just that uh, instead of getting everything from a build pack, you would be getting uh, from your repository, the image that you created, you deploy that into your Docker environment, which will then run as a pod. You can define your deployment strategy, replica strategy. I want to have three pods running all the time. Uh, the good thing about it is it's, it's easier to manage the downtime uh, of the application because at some point of time you want to deploy a new version. Uh, what it will do is if you have three instances running, it start killing one, deploy the new ones, killing the second, deploy the second one, so your app is some, in some sense running all the time. So that was the Kubernetes thing. And deployment uh, with managed services. So this is the point. If, if you feel that was uh, still a very involved process, or if you want to do, uh, uh, if you want your data scientist to do that, for him it could be a bit daunting, maybe in the beginning, to do that. There are actually managed services uh, which do that for you out of the box. So what happens in those cases is uh, you have machine learning model, and this managed service provides you some kind of, uh, let's say. Uh, a SDK or a Python client, some kind of client, which is kind of one-click deployment. So you have this model, you say, I want to deploy this. It will deploy this model, take care of creating the container for you, managing the versions of that, the evaluation metrics for that, things like that. And if you want to say, uh, my application uh, model is running, if the threshold, the confidence score goes below 80 uh, points, 80 per, uh, yeah, and then redeploy the app, Things like that. So they are actually you can do it with 
So I just know of these. You can do it with, with any uh, cloud provider, I think, possibly. So uh, Amazon, Azure, IBM Watson, machine learning. So since I'm an IBM employee, I have to talk about it. I don't have to talk about it, but I have access to the tools, and I, it's, it's free for me, so I did it with uh, Watson Machine Learning. Uh, let me quickly tell you how would it look like there. Yeah, how would it look like in, in a managed services uh, is that uh, I create the instance of managed services, which gives me credentials, so to say the entitlement to do this. It will say, uh, so there's this client called Watson Machine Learning Client. You can save your model. I say the author of this model is me. That's my email ID. That's my fraud detection model, uh, which has the AUC area under curve score of 0.81. Publish this model and store this in my repository. It says publish the model. This is a fraud detection model. Uh, initializing deployment success. Uh, at the end, it just gives you the scoring endpoint. So the things that I did manually using a Docker image or a Python build pack, it will do it for you out of the box. It will say you, this is your endpoint. Just go ahead and start adding it to your uh, applications. How the scoring would look like, it's basically the same. Uh, I just get the scoring payload. I say client.deployments, so take my deployment and score this. It will just say, okay, this is, I think it's not a fraud, and these are the confidence that I have on that. Yep, let me switch back to the presentation. Correct. So, what I wanted to achieve, I hope you are a bit motivated, or at least informed about how you can do it, or at least have some things to, to Google around, uh, how, how would you go with that? I showed you deployment with Cloud Foundry, partially also deployment with Kubernetes, uh, deployment with managed services using IBM Watson, uh, all the things there. Uh, in the slide, if you're, if you're getting it from the uh, conference website, you have some links uh, where you can learn more about the three platforms that I talked about. And in the end, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So I'll take any questions. Yep, sure. So at Ford, we're a huge PCF shop, so this is awesome. Thank you very much for the presentation. A Thank couple you. of quick integration questions. Have you tried leveraging Kafka using Spring Cloud Stream mm -hmm. with PCF? So that kind of integration point, and then we see a lot of PySpark, and I know that the Python Spark runtime is kind of a dependency. So using PySpark inside of a PCF container. Yeah, exactly. So. Uh First of all, thanks for the question. Uh, I'll take the second question first, because I know it better. Uh, with PySpark, so it's actually not very different. Uh, what happens is when people think about Spark, you basically think about very huge uh, use cases. Uh, but what, what's important to, use, uh, to notice here is that my training was done on, on a different cluster. Now I'm just taking care of scoring. And for scoring, uh, you just you need Python pipeline. But for that, you, you just download a, Python ima a Docker image with, uh, with PySpark in it. And you, uh, in your scoring endpoint, you initiate the pipeline. So that's actually not very different. Uh, so I have done the PySpark case. And about the Kubernetes, uh, about the Kafka use case, I have not done it myself. Uh, but I can imagine how, how would it look like. But, but we can talk about it if, if you have more questions. Or else. Yeah. Yep. Uh, when you serialize the model, how many bytes is that? Uh, this one was not much. I think it was a few kilobytes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if it's a deep learning model, it can, it can go to a bit more. Okay. Do you think it's better to persist that byte stream in the database or persist like a file path to the model in the database? Uh, that's a good question. But the thing is, uh, we want to sustain with like, things like Docker and Cloud Foundry, you want to keep your application as stateless as possible. So you do not want to keep this application with a local file system all the time. So that's why you want to communicate with something outside so you can kill this container at any time without thinking about it. And then you just say, okay, I have a new application. I just download it from my account. Yeah. Yep, and also depends upon what's the size of your model. So, so a few databases have start having problems. It goes before four, uh, above four gigabytes or four gigabytes a single model. Uh, then that's a problem. Exactly. Uh, at the end, that's my uh, email ID. If anyone has questions, just write me. I really like to talk about this stuff. Perfect. Thank you for your attention, everyone.